Hi, this is Dr. Emily Scherning with AR. Now that we've finished the 50 States project, I feel like we can pull back out, take a look at the future climactic zones that will be emerging in the US. Because when we look at the future, when we look at the America that's gonna emerge by 2050 under the RCP 4.5 modeling scenario, it's not just about us. This question, what are plant and animal communities gonna be doing? Where are they gonna be moving? I don't know about you, but that's a big interest of mine as I try and think about climactic zones and bioregions in the US. Supporting the dry plains transition in my area, helping to create habitat. I put a lot of time into those projects when I'm not working on these videos, but try and stay focused and get going. I tried to cover this information in our first live stream and uh, frankly, I worked that up pretty good. So this video is an attempt to get a calmer, less scrawled visual presentation of the same concepts. We'll start on the East Coast, we'll move to the West, and I'll give some information about Alaska and Hawaii. But first, check out this new opener my husband made as we attempt to create less uh, violently amateurish content. Starting here in Maine, working all the way down through Pennsylvania, we've got two connected great climactic zones forming. They're connected because they're both good, but they will have different characters. You've got this sort of true north zone here in one will where things will feel about like they do now in the milder parts of the region. So if you're in central Vermont, you go and check that out. That's what Maine will feel like in uh, 2050. And you've got this wonderful sort of iron fastness then extending down the line of Appalachia to uh, Virginia, West Virginia. Eastern West Virginia is a nice spot. Together, this whole place, it's uh, fantastic. It's going to stay cool in the summer. It's going to stay cool in the winter. And it divides these two new climactic zones to the east and to the west. And those are connected by the Mohawk Valley in New York. That's a critical migration corridor for you right there through the Mohawk Valley. We're going to call this blob here, number three to the left, that's warm lake land. It's going to get really like really a lot warmer there during the summer with growing seasons over a month longer in some places. There's also going to be a loss of winter chill. It's just, it's a transforming area, but fertile, some nice possibilities. If you think about how lowland Virginia is today, how that area really nurtured the roots of America, that's kind of a climate analog for warm lakeland. And over here towards the coast, towards the ocean, we have a warm coast. It's a lot warmer there in the future, but honestly, it's pretty nice. It's not like too hot to handle, except in the heart of New York City, but some of that's heat island effect. Once you get about halfway down into New Jersey, that brings us to the New South. And let's check that out. That's this whole area that has a five over it today. And when I'm saying New South, you could be like, I think that that's already in the South. Shift this down, shift it down. We're taking about like deep South. We're talking about Tennessee feeling like the deep South feels today. Have, like Northern Mississippi is gonna be your climate analog for a lot of that area. It's going to be hot and humid, and you're going to see transformational landscape change. It's going to turn into deep south feeling area. So you get ready. You're going to want to foster plants that can handle zone seven winters or above and can handle at least 120 days over 86 a year. Let's look a little bit further west here to this big zone up here in zone six. That's the growing stuff zone, my favorite place. That includes this coveted area. I'm going to show you this is a special place. This is like cool Lakeland. You know, we had warm Lakeland over here for three. Hugging the western edge of the Great Lakes, we got the cool Lakeland area, which is one of the few places that will remain relatively cool in the summer in that central part of the US. It's also conveniently where many communities that are actually pretty cool will be able to grow and thrive, including Minnesota's Twin Cities and Chicago. If you want to live in a major city that is unlikely to dry out or light on fire, those are some excellent options for you. As you get away from the lakes, you'll enter the areas where we'll be able to continue to grow many of the crops we know and love today, such as corn and soy, the foundational ingredients for the unhealthy snacks on which America runs. It's not going to have great summer cool preservation. It's going to be kind of like Kansas summers were 10 years ago. But growing our current staple crops, that's a big deal. Like seriously, this whole new south region, this whole uh, area five, that's the line where we're going to get crop failure for corn and soy by 2050. We're going to need to make some real crop changes south of the growing stuff zone, but there's hope there. You can check out my video from a couple weeks ago, Hot and Ready, about hot climate staple crops you could grow today. Now, I'd like to point out this narrow band between the new south 
and the growing stuff zone. Zone seven here. This band, it, it's a, like a boring area, which frankly, looking forward to the future, boredom is a pretty good option, right? This area is going to experience remarkably little relative change compared to other parts of the U.S. It's going to get hotter in the summer, but outside of heat wave years, there will be people in zone seven who claim nothing has happened and everything is the same. They will be wrong, but they're going to say it anyway. Good for them. If you're the kind of freak who already thinks Southern Indiana is paradise, you're going to enjoy your future. There's some hope, too, in Zone 7 for continuing central hardwoods growth. And that's important when we consider the potential for broad disruptions to forestry that are firming up with this level of national change. This area to the west of this boring area, look at Zone 8. This is the area that could desertify. It could be part of the Great Western Desert or it could be okay. It really, it matters what happens exactly with the precipitation trends, and it matters how well we manage to share water. In these states here, Oklahoma, Kansas, there's a real distinct cline of precipitation where the eastern sides of the states would be okay, be able to function pretty normally. The western sides could become too dry. We have serious challenges related to potential desertification and soil loss there. A lot of those states, I'm looking at you, especially Oklahoma, are working on it. They're going to need to focus on soil preservation here, or we could get another big dust bowl. Worse than the 30s. Very bad. Working our way further down, we got this area here, Zone 9, that includes most of Louisiana. I'm calling this the Mega South. If the South today is not Southern enough for you, you're going to love the new Mega South. It's going to be even hotter here, so hot that you will lose a substantial amount of potential working hours, which, come on, guys. Do we really like working hours? Or those of us who might appreciate Mega South's unique flavor, do we maybe want more opportunities for day drinking? That's the attitude we need to have in this area as we dig in. A real ability to roll with it and be like able to hunker down and chill out. There will be heat hazards in this area. The ability to kind of strategically lie low will be an important survival skill. There will be some real trouble in this region and the Gulf with sea level rise. The summer is going to get at least a month longer and it's gonna just be humid and wet and gross. But wet and gross is more survivable, better than way too dry, which is what we see as we head further west. If you're gonna be hanging out in zone nine here, in this sort of mega south area, it's gonna become subtropical. It's gonna become something new. And speaking of subtropical, I wanna take a minute to highlight these little zones here before we head west. Let's check out zone 10, because if you like Florida, you may enjoy new Florida. The Florida that, much like a pepper tree, has managed to escape its boundaries and overtake neighboring states. This new Florida area, it actually has a lot of potential for great subtropical agricultural production, for citrus production. I'm very interested in what will happen here. And I'm also interested in what will happen in the increasingly dangerous mega Florida down here. We're looking at greatly expanded true tropical territory here in the U.S., and it's got a lot of problems, but especially to the Atlantic side. The sea level rise predictions are not as extreme as some people have been led to believe. And having true topical territory in the domestic U.S., I think that's actually going to be kind of a big deal for anyone who wants to eat a mango by, by mid-century. As a typical human being, I love mangoes, so I'm not unhappy to think maybe we're going to get some serious domestic cultivation potential. We all know today there are plenty of people who are willing to be in Florida for the sake of being in Florida. All those folks, they're now going to get to choose between new Florida with the same great feeling as our current Florida, and mega Florida, for Florida wasn't quite Florida enough for you. Now let's go west. You may have noticed this little blob here in Southern Texas, zone 12, just don't go there. I'd stay out of inland Southern Texas. It's gonna be very, very hot and then get a little bit further west to this big area. It's so big, it's so much of the country and it's just gonna to be too hot and too dry. This is the real problem. This area is gonna to get too dry. This whole area, this great emerging Western desert, it's gonna be very hard to get enough water to maintain our current lifestyles. People can desalinate by the coasts and everything. It's not like everyone should run away screaming, but if you're in this area and you're on the fence about getting up, come up to the growing stuff zone, hang out with me. I think you will have a better, easier future somewhere else, particularly if you're living in Arizona, particularly if you're living in the Phoenix megalopolis. It can be better somewhere else. In between the Great Western Desert and this sort of transitional desert area where it might be true dry, we've got these nice islands. And these are drawn like big, horrible blobs. They're not. They're small altitude-specific regions. 
The Sky Island Zone is small but mighty. Utah, stop letting your creepy salt lake dry up. Don't shoot yourself in the foot there. And the Wasatch Mountains, that whole area could be so great. Central Colorado, the Denver area, beautiful. Taos, northern New Mexico, you guys, of everyone in the nation, have shown that you can recharge an aquifer. You all, I'm very interested in what the New Mexico skylines will do. In all these skylines area, you're going to need to be careful with your water in these areas, as with the whole West. But your future climate is otherwise not so different from your current climate. I think the Sky Islands are wonderful. I think that they are going to be powerful destinations. Up here, sitting next to your friend and mine, the Growing Steps Zone, and Zone 15 is our terrifying chaos factory. Look up the data for that little area, particularly like right here. It's good. Then you're going to sit and you're going to cry for a minute. It's going to get really weird there. There's some exceptions. The high altitude skiing areas in uh, Idaho, they look like they're going to hold out longer for better skiing than almost anywhere else. But here in the Chaos Factory, you should expect extreme storms, intense changes in seasonal stream flows, and violently transforming landscapes. I I'm kind of scared of this zone, which is why I saved for last the nice Chaos area. Over here in this part of the Pacific Northwest, the baseline outlook is great, unlike in the terrifying Chaos Factory. In this nice chaos zone, we're going to have some bad years where atmospheric rivers align with wildfires and heat waves and it all sucks really bad. But we're going to have as many or more good years where the land feels almost exactly like it does in good years today. And up in Washington, which is one of the most baseline stable outlooks of any state in the country, it's really pretty sweet, they're going to be able to take care of whales for us too. Gray whales and orca whales, they're now hanging out year round in Puget Sound. And there's a population of gray whales that just started doing it, and, and good for them. The oceans are looking really scary, folks. They're taking a bigger hit than the land and the changes that are coming to us all. I love it that maybe gray whales have found themselves a place to dig in. I know that the good people around this sound, they're going to do their best to help the whales. Does you ever feel like giving up on hope? Look back at the data from the 60s and see how close we came to losing all the whales. Whales are still struggling, but they're here. They're still here with us. There's a hell of a lot of problems on this planet, but we pulled back from that cliff before. And with every one of the challenges where we pulled back from the cliff, we needed hope to do that, right? So there's the national landscape for the US. Let's just take a second and talk about Alaska and Hawaii. Hawaii is looking at some of the most serious problems available and they're working harder than anyone else to get on top of them. God bless you, Hawaii. Hawaii needs us all to pull emissions down. They're working as hard as they can. You read about the energy transformation there, they're working so hard, but if we don't get emissions down, Hawaii can't save itself. Don't go to Hawaii and be a dumb tourist. Listen to the people of Hawaii, the Hawaiian people. They're trying to get all hands on deck. They don't want their future to be serving you mixed drinks. The projected changes for Hawaii, let's just say, even under RCP 4.5, they suck really bad. Which brings us to Alaska. Now that is a place with a lot going on. I gotta go back and do an updated version of the Alaska video now that I'm better at sharing images and figures because the regional variation Alaska is very intense and interesting. The whole state is transforming. There will be transformational changes over the next 30 years. High risk situation, high reward situation. And when I say hi, I mean hi. Myself, I'm not into it. I, I'd recommend for the average person, tuck yourself in around the Great Lakes, east or west, depending on both your climate preference and how much of your life you want to revolve around cheese. FYI, the cheese gradient definitely increases here on the western edge, just FYI. So now that you know all about that, where do you go? If you want to minimize the degree to which your future will be dystopia, going north is part of the future, the solution. I would recommend as a top pick, the western side here of the Great Lakes. There's better summer conservation. There's decent infrastructure. Get up into Michigan and Ohio. Let's say the infrastructure needs some improvement. And them and the UP, it's not looking to hold the cold as well as anyone might hope. Ohio in particular, surprisingly dramatic heat up. It's really very challenging. So like some people in this climate space, they just say, go to the Great Lakes. But there's a, they're all pretty good, you know, but the Western side, it's better connected to a larger agricultural area and further from more dangerous wildfire activity, which we're gonna see a lot of that down here. It's got better climate preservation on the Western side. It's an overall better bet to my mind. But if you like a warmer, mild climate like we see in Virginia today, the Eastern Great Lakes might be more your speed. I'm willing to say I probably like it colder than some people. Over on the edge of warm Lakeland here in central New York particularly, there will be just a terrific variety of microclimates. A lot of possibilities for growing many specialty crops. I think this area has the potential to become just a fantastic diverse agricultural zone 
In many ways, it looks similar climactically to France of 10 years ago. Very exciting area in the east there. Here's the problem with central New York, though, and this is just about the only problem Pennsylvania. I mean, if you stay out of Philly, Pennsylvania as a whole is just a fantastic outlet. The only problem with these places here in the east is, let's look over to a population map, is check out this giant urbanized belt. This area here, it's pretty vulnerable. We're talking about extreme change. The outlook for Long Island in particular, which is just red with humans, not good. Long Island is very vulnerable to sea level rise. The whole continental shelf, you know, I said things are worse in the ocean than on the land. Well, they're touching too much ocean here. So I was saying nice things about Pennsylvania. Let's trace the spine of this zone of conservation. Take it all the way up to Maine. You got good outlooks here, but all those people are going to come in, right? Many people are interested in Washington. There's good potential there. High risk, but high reward. Get yourself back from the sea. That's all I'm saying. We're overdue for some ring of fire tsunami action, all the tribal records so indicate. The Sky Islands, they're in an area where you could establish a good footing, but you want to make sure you have community fit. In Utah, it all depends on the outcomes for that lake. You've got to bet which way you think the community is going to go on the lake. The northern New Mexico Sky Islands, a lot of them are held by the Ute, and they are fragile. You shouldn't go to New Mexico if you don't want to learn how to behave yourself. The most accessible Sky Island for the typical America, that's in Colorado. Very expensive real estate, but it's still the most culturally accessible, lowest acclimations, safest conventional bed of the Sky Islands. If you need a deal, if you're looking for a place under 100K, you know Colorado is not for you. If you need a deal, come over here by me in the Growing Stuff Zone. I don't know about everywhere, but in Iowa, many communities are actively recruiting new people. And you should know that includes actively welcoming people of color. There are more communities in this region than you think, where the current population, which is old and white, wants you to fix up a house. They desperately want you to raise your kids in these communities. They want you and your family to join the community. They think it's been too quiet there for too long. In the last 20 years, the interest in multicultural immigration has increased tremendously. It started when they had to shut down the hospitals when they couldn't have anyone giving birth there anymore. Storm Lake in Iowa is a working class community with lots of jobs. They're actively recruiting a new population for their next generation. Storm Lake wants you to own a home. They want you to have your American dream. I know there are a fair amount of Latinos who have subscribed to this channel who are looking for places for their families to go. I wanted you to get this message in particular from the people of Iowa. But now it's time to wrap this up. Wrapping it up, here are your most dangerous areas. Lower Colorado Basin. Get out of the lower Colorado Basin. Don't be there. This is a bad place. This part of the Gulf, if you're anywhere near the water, bad. You don't want to be here. Houston, get out. Southern Louisiana, live on a boat. I'm not even joking. The whole infrastructure here is going to be FUBAR. You should get out or you should live on a boat. Seriously, living on a boat is a better option than living on land in this area. If you're on the fence in California, get out of California. California needs less people in it if it's going to make it. And here are your best places. And remember, don't just make a decision on the climate data. There are a lot of good places here. Look for your best cultural fit. My favorite picks, this strip of the east, away from the sea. the Western Great Lakes and inland Pacific Northwest, particularly focused in Washington. This is not an exhaustive list. If you watch the state level videos, you'll find that almost every state has some little pocket with nice relative preservation. There's a big swath of America that's not in those best packets and that isn't on my get out list. You might've noticed the get out list is as small as the best places list. That big swath of America where you don't need to get out and you can't support a whole hell of a lot more people coming in, that's where we need to build resilience. And that, that's what my organization is all about. Finding those places of hope, because there is hope. We can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.